Adley Rutschman, of course, a very exciting rookie for the Orioles this year. But in the final month of the season, they had another exciting rookie join the team. That was Gunnar Henderson. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to talk about his season, both in the minors and the majors, and look forward to how good he could be for the Orioles in 2023. That's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. And welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And today I am joined by Bob Phelan. You know him, of course, as one of the co-hosts of the On The Verge podcast over at Baltimore Sports Life covering all things Orioles minor leagues. And of course, we had to have him on to continue our player review series to talk about probably the best player in the minor leagues for the Orioles this year. And then you could argue for a spurt there in September was maybe the Orioles best player in the major leagues as well. But first of all, Bob, thank you so much for uh, joining us here again on the show. Always good to be here. Thanks for having me back. And so, you know, last time I saw you, you were wearing your Gunnar Henderson jersey. So, of course, we got to talk about Gunnar Henderson. And uh, we're going to get to him in a second. But I wanted to touch on just a couple of quick topics. First, I know this has been kind of a back and forth among Orioles fans. I put up a poll on Twitter yesterday. And right now it's about 55% Astros right now. From an Orioles fan's lens, who are you cheering for in the World Series? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Obviously, we got Trey Mancini on the Astros. And, you know, they're, they've kind of been there six, seven years in a row now. But I do know some Phillies fans and, and be happy for them. But ultimately, I think I got to root for Trey, let him get his ring, and then maybe he'll come back to Baltimore on a super cheap deal. Yeah, I, for me, I'm going to be good either way, I think, because I think the scenes from Philly, if they win this World Series with this team, because when they won last time, I mean, you could argue they were the best team in baseball when they beat the Rays in, in 2008. I mean, that team was absolutely loaded. And this team has a lot of talent, but – you know, in the regular season, you're watching them. You're going, eh, maybe this is a playoff team, but I don't know if this team's going to win the World Series. And the Astros, I think, have looked like the best team, at least in the American League, all year. I'm over the trash can thing a little bit. And with Trey Mancini being on the team, makes it even better. And there's the argument, well, hey, you know, Trey will probably sign elsewhere this offseason. He'll have five, six more years to win a ring. But he's in the World Series right now, and some guys never even get there. So it would be nice to, to see him win one. It'd be cool to see Dusty Baker win one, I think, as well. I think the big part for Orioles fans is the Yankees are not there, which makes it a lot easier to watch. Oh yeah, for sure. And, you know, maybe they'll sweep the Phillies, go undefeated in the playoffs. And that's, that's their way to bow out in time for the, the new Astros, the Orioles to come in and take their place. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if, if this team's going to win, you know, two world series in these six years, I think uh, the Orioles building like they built uh, sounds pretty good to me. And then there was one piece of Orioles news that dropped actually just before we were recording rock Cabaco of Masson reported it. Uh, Andy Costco, the Baltimore sun confirming as well that the Orioles are bringing their entire coaching staff back for the 2023 season. They're making one addition. Cody Ashey uh, will be in the dugout. It looks like in kind of a, a hitting coordinator analyst kind of role, similar to what he was doing throughout the minor leagues this year for the Orioles, but they're bringing everybody back. We knew already earlier in the season, Nathan Ruiz had reported that Brandon Hyde would be back, but the rest of his staff will be back. It was a staff that got turned over a little bit last year. Of course, they added Ryan Fuller and Matt Pork Schulte as their hitting coaches. They added some more guys to the dugout, but it seems like with the team completely overperforming expectations, probably a good idea to just run it back in 2023. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this is much of a surprise to anybody. I mean, Brandon Hyde should be right there for manager of the year. I think the hitting coaches, yeah, maybe you could nitpick that some guys didn't improve, but they had like no offseason, a shortened spring training. So, yeah, the pitching, obviously the pitching development was fantastic in 2022. So, yeah, bring all these guys back, see what they can do with one more year. And I actually got to meet Cody Ashey at our live show a couple weeks ago and talk to him a little bit. And the organization is clearly high on him. And if the organization's high on him, then I got to be too. Seemed like a smart guy talking to him. And clearly the player development down in the minors is going pretty well. Yeah, I always find it interesting, those guys who are, you know, they're big leaguers, but they're never star big leaguers. They're never close to all stars, not even really starters for that long. And then they kind of have always that analytical edge to them when they play and they become these great coaches and great front office guys. Sam Fold is another guy who's 
you know, maybe going to be, uh, you know, somebody's president of baseball ops soon, who of course was kind of like a, a light hitting fourth outfielder for the Rays for a while. And it seems like Cody Ashy in, in a different spot because he's, you know, moving up in the on-field coaching role, but seems to have been just a huge pickup for the Orioles this year. And then obviously guys like Chris Holt, I mean, bringing him back. I mean, you hope Chris Holt is here for a long, long time, unless he wants a managerial role, which you never know could be in his sights. If he want, wanted this big league pitching coach role, you know, we should hope that he'll be here for a long time because what he's done in the minors, and the majors is just ridiculous. But back on the hitting side, as you mentioned, that was the, you know, three phases of the game, starting pitching bullpen and hitting and even throw defense in there as well. You know, the one thing that was actually in some spots down from 2021 was the Orioles offense, but they got a little spark at the end of the year from Gunnar Henderson. And that is who we're here to talk about today. So just wanted to start with first the thoughts of, how do you assess that, you know, one month, these, you know, plate appearances that we got to see from Gunnar Henderson, 132 of them in 2022. What's kind of the, you know, all encompassing assessment of the first taste we got of, you know, one of the best prospects the Orioles have had in, in a few years. I mean, I gotta, I gotta think you, you have to say it's a, it's a great start to his career. Obviously. I mean, coming into 2022, he was obviously a guy in our, top three top five of the prospects had a great 2021 but I don't think anyone expected him to improve as much as he did and develop as much as he did in just one short offseason and he really just raced through the system and basically in his major league time he put up similar numbers to he did in 2021 uh, in the minor leagues if not better and at the major league level against major league pitching same walk rate 12.1 percent as he had in 2021 in the minors struck out about five percent less a little bit less power, but yeah, I think it's a fantastic learning experience and I expect it to just get better from here. Yeah, we'll read out the, the the full stats in the big leagues. Was called up on August 31st. He played in 34 games. He was basically in there every single day till the end of the season, whether he's playing third or short or second base. 132 plate appearances. He had a 259 average, a 348 on base, and a 440 slugging. That was good for a 125 WRC plus, making him 25% better than the average big league hitter in his first month in the bigs. About a 12% walk rate, as you talked about, about a 26% strikeout rate. He had four home runs and 18 RBIs in that stretch as well and was worth about one win according to fan graphs via war. And here's kind of the next thing I wanted to get to before we, you know, get into the nitty gritty of the season, him and the minors, what we look for moving forward. Now that you saw the end of the season play out and we're into the off season, we saw what the Orioles did, you know, despite his best efforts, kind of, I wouldn't say crumbling, but just running out of gas in September, not being able to get into the postseason. How do you feel now versus how you felt in mid August about them waiting that long to call him up? I think, yeah, you probably could have seen him up a little bit sooner. I think he would have been fine. But obviously, I think the fact is just they're so high on him that they expect him to really contend for that rookie of the year next year and net them another bonus draft pick, which maybe they'll offset, you know, signing a guy that could lose him a draft pick in the next, this or the next offseason. But, yeah, definitely, I think it's okay that they waited that long because he's still got enough experience at the end of the year to get him ready for next year. But, yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> calling for him was not a bad idea earlier than that. Yeah, I think how well he played kind of hurt more that he wasn't up for, for you know, that basically August. Because I, I don't think I was ever in like June saying, let's get Gunnar Henderson to the big leagues. But I think once we got to August, once we got past the trade deadline, once Trey Mancini was dealt, you started to see the offense falter a little bit more than they had most of the year. And that's when the murmur started, I think, in August. And I think if you coupled, here's one thing I kind of look back on. If you couple the Trey Mancini trade and the next day you call up Gunnar Henderson, you know how much of that blowback that they would have been able to just push down a little bit? I mean, yeah, fans still would have been upset about a Mancini trade, but if the next day you see Gunnar Henderson replacing him in the lineup, that at least helps you a little bit. And it helps, you know, my argument always was, okay, you're going to trade Trey. I'm not a fan, but maybe you feel like you're trading him because you're not getting him back. Can you supplant him with adding at the deadline? Maybe at the very least, you could have added Gunnar Henderson. That's kind of how I look back at it. But it's in the past. I don't think him getting called up August 2nd would have put them in the playoffs anyway. They, they ran out of gas either way. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't in the cards 
this year. But we'll talk about, you know, what he looked like in the minors and, and also what he could look like next year coming up in just a second. But first, got to tell you about betonline.net, which is your number one source for all your football betting here in this NFL and college football season. Every weekend, all the lines, all the odds on every single game out there. And it's not just football. We got the World Series coming up this week, starting Friday between the Astros and the Phillies. You can bet on every game there. And also, hey, the NBA and the NHL seasons just kicking off. So much going on in the world of sports and so much going on at betonline.net, which is your continued source for all your sports wagering info. They've got live betting. They've got up-to-the-minute scores. You can get analysis. You can listen to podcasts about every game for every sport out there. So head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more. That's BetOnline where the game starts. So we're here with Bob Phelan of BSL on the verge who covers all things Orioles minor leagues. We're talking about Gunnar Henderson's great season with the Orioles that ended with him really putting on a show at the plate in the big leagues. But before that, he truly put on a show in the minor leagues in double a Bowie. It was kind of hilarious watching him play in Bowie this year. I mean, it was 47 games. He hit at right about 200 plate appearances in Bowie this year and everyone looked around and just said, what's this guy doing here? And I, I just wanted to take us back to kind of those last couple of weeks of Gunnar Henderson and Bowie. I mean, you guys were talking like he's he's mastered this level. You guys were talking on the podcast about it's time for AAA. He was so much better than the pitchers he was facing. The incredible stat line is that, I mean, he had a better walk rate than a strikeout rate. He was walking more than he was striking out in over 200 plate appearances with, you know, a, a 176 WRC+. plus. I mean... He was ridiculous. Double-A pitchers had to be just ecstatic that he got moved up to triple-A. Yeah, I mean, it was insane. Like, to go from a guy who was striking out 30.9% through all levels, even low-A Del Marva last year, to have a walk rate higher than a strikeout rate was just like, okay, you can see the clear development. Like, this is one of the best prospects in baseball, potentially, if he can keep this up at triple-A, which he obviously did to a lesser extent. But he was hitting for power. And it seemed like he was even hitting in some bad luck, honestly, because his numbers could have been even better. I think the thing that really stood out offensively is he was pulling the ball a lot more. And in 2021, he was letting that just natural opposite, opposite field power um, just launch balls into left center field, left field for him runs. But he was turning on the ball way more than he did the previous year. And, yeah, that, it, was, uh, it was an exciting time, to be sure. So then he goes to AAA. And, and, yeah, he had a few more growing pains. You know, the strikeout rate went up, and, and that was – I think really the only talking point, it was that and like, can he play second base defensively when people were talking about kind of keeping him down in the minor leagues, but the offense was still there. 138 WRC plus he still hit 288. He still slugged over 500 in just shy of 300 plate appearances at triple a. And we really saw the power there as well. I mean, 11 home runs in that stretch and he just continued to hit the ball hard and was hitting it to all fields. But again, was showing that pool side power, from the left side and and you know he was still able to hit lefties and you know could stand in there as well and and we just saw it kind of creep up and creep up that it was just like okay he's ready but when he went to triple a did you think the big leagues were in the cards this season kind of that first month or so in triple a honestly no i think i was still like he's going to just finish strong in triple a hopefully he'll you know even if he starts slow like he did in aberdeen last year maybe he'll He'll eventually adjust and set himself up for a chance to break out of spring training in 2023 in the, on the roster. But, man, he, I think what he really proved this year is just how quick he's been able to adjust to – like he didn't see enough left-handed pitching in A, so that's, I think, one of the reasons they wanted to get him up to AAA a little bit quicker. And he, he hit him fine in AAA. I mean, he hit the home run off of that Brewers uh, left-handed starting pitching prospect, who I can't remember his name right now, but uh, Ashby. Ethan – or oh Ethan, I, yeah, Ethan Small, yes. Ethan Small, yeah. So yeah, right away he showed I can hit lefties. And I think he was just on a mission to get to the majors and obviously he succeeded. Yeah, he did it. And and he got to the big leagues and and that first home run in Cleveland was was just awesome. To, to go deep in your first game, to hit a ball that hard, to get the the just the chuckle from Jim Palmer as the ball is flying through the air is just one of the best broadcast moments, I think, of the year for that Orioles broadcast team. But what we did see in, again, you know, just about 130 plate appearances in the big leagues is that, first of all, he mashed fastballs against fastballs this year in the big leagues, a 322 average. He had a 576 slugging against fastballs. Guys were just not getting the fastball by him. But as you'll see with young hitters, 
they got the breaking ball past him at times. And so that's something he's going to work on this offseason. I'm sure he hit just 156 against breaking balls. He slugged just 320 at a 35% whiff rate against breaking balls. And it was righties and lefties that were throwing him curveballs and sliders to get him out. And, you know, no one was ever saying there's no holes in Gunnar Henderson's game when we were trying to get him called up. We just knew that, hey, he still might have these few issues he needs to iron out. But the way he hits fastballs, and the way he puts the ball in play hard every single time was going to be better than anything the Orioles had. And I think that's what they saw. And Bob, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, how he adjusts this offseason, what we see from him in big league spring training and those first couple months of his first you know, full big league season, I think is going to show a lot about Gunnar Henderson. Yeah, that is a great point because like you said, I mean, he hit the ball hard pretty consistently. He was, I mean, obviously much smaller percentage of a uh, sample size than a lot of the guys that were on the team most of the year, but he led the the Orioles in hard hit percentage uh, with 53.7%. He was fourth in barrel percentage behind only Ryan Mountcastle, Anthony Santander, and Kyle Stowers, of all people. And uh, he was also first in average exit velocity, 92.4, and first in chase percentage, 17.9%. So he chased the ball even less than Adley Rutschman did, who, you know, obviously <laughs> did pretty good in that regard, but the one thing he needs to do is he needs to hit the ball in the air. He hit the ball hard, but it was a 2% launch angle. And I mean, I, obviously he's proven in the minor leagues, at least that he's able to do that. But that's, I think just uh, the one thing he could do is try to get some loft. And maybe it is the breaking balls that are going to, if he can adjust to those and he'll be able to, to, to do that. Yeah. And you know, we're talking about a 21 year old kid here as well. So yeah. it's yeah. almost like, you know, he's got so much room to improve. I think a lot of people even thought, Hey, if this guy's really good, they probably had 2023 circled for his big league debut. And he got there the year prior and it helped that the O's were contending and it helped that he was mashing every pitcher he was facing in double A AA and triple A, but he got there. So now we look forward to that 2023 season. And instead of it being a question of, is Gunnar Henderson going to break camp with the team? I think everyone in the world knows Gunnar Henderson is going to break camp with the team. He's going to be in the lineup every single day, barring an unforeseen injury. So my question to you is, you know, we saw the second base experiment go and we understood why Jorge Mateo, gold glove caliber, no matter what the voters say at shortstop, Ramon Arias, gold glove caliber at third base. Both of them were hitting a bit when Henderson came up as well. And you had Rugnet Odor, who you at least wanted to play a little bit, the Orioles still wanted to do. So do you think the second base thing happens at all? I mean, it, you know, if the Orioles maybe bring in a shortstop, or is where do you think he's cemented defensively? I know a lot of this has to do with what this offseason looks like, but where do you think he plays the most games next year? I think he's a left side of the infield kind of guy. I don't know, maybe in a pinch if there's an injury, or because we got some pretty good, uh, prospects coming up on that it could play second base a little bit better, a little more natural, like Jordan Westberg, Joey Ortiz, Connor Norby, et cetera, et cetera. But I think he can, he proved that he, that's actually one of the things I feel like he improved just as much as his offense from 2021 was the defense. Cause seeing him in person in 2021, I'm like, I don't know about shortstop. He's got the range, but the balls are just getting under his glove and he'll probably be better at third base. But then this year, just even in the minor leagues, watching him on uh, MILB TV, you could see he was getting to the balls. He was fielding them. The arm is obviously strong. So I think he's at least the starting third baseman. And I think you can make an argument that he could play shortstop too. I mean, obviously just Jorge Mateo is just on another level, despite what the gold glove results have said. But yeah, I think he's clearly left side of the infield. Yeah, and, and things are going to shake up. And that's the good thing about this conversation is that we don't really know how the team's going to look like. Will Ramon Arias be here next year? How much will they trust Jorge Mateo to start the season? Does the big free agent come in? Or is Jordan Westberg on the opening day roster? We have so many questions there to kind of answer. You know, can Taron Vavra find a role? That's also going to be a question for that infield as well. And so all those things are going to be answered. Heck, they could bring in an infielder. You know, if they go after Carlos Correa and Whiff, they could bring in kind of a middle tier guy to just be in that mix as well. So it will be really interesting. But what is good about this conversation is it's just a conversation of where and not if. And they're going to, whether it's DHing some, whether it's third, whether it's short, he's going to be in there every single day next year. So we end with this. Where do you think the ceiling looks like for Gunnar Henderson next year? And is there a floor maybe for his first full year that you even want to speak into existence at all? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the floor is probably just more of what we saw in the, the last month or so of the season, just stretched out to a full season. So, I mean, that would still be 25% better than the average, like you said. Maybe the floor is a little bit lower than that if you can't adjust to the breaking ball. But I'm not really putting much thought into that. I think just the growth mindset that he's shown to have. He's grew up in this player development system. Like, he's totally bought in. Clearly just a great case for why the Orioles should be confident in what they're doing because of the way he's developed. And if he can just continue to improve, God, I think he's got superstar potential. Maybe not this coming season in 2023, but by the time he's, what, 24, 25, this could be one of the best players in baseball. And, yeah, I think the best case next year is he's an all-star third baseman and hitting 30 home runs with 20 steals because, obviously, he's got the speed. He's 91st percentile in speed, stole 38 out of 43 stolen bases the last two years in the minor leagues underrated part of his game and uh yeah sky's the limit with Gunner. yeah it's funny we we went this long on the podcast didn't even mention the speed which is like maybe an elite skill that he also has in his game and he is a legitimate five tool player that doesn't get talked about as much because there's not as many of them because some guys do like three of the tools so well that they don't need the other tools in in modern major league baseball but he legitimately might be that five tool player yeah i think you know AL Rookie of the Year is certainly in the cards for Gunnar Henderson next year. I don't know if All-Star is happening just because of all the talent and whether it be shortstop or third base as well. But if he's the Rookie of the Year and he's hitting in the middle of that Orioles order, and that's the thing, you know, he was, I think he kind of settled into around fifth for most of the year in the order. I mean, if the O's go big and get a Trey Turner, he's probably leading off with Adley batting second. And at some point, Gunnar Henderson's going to hit third. And even if that's not the case, you could probably bat Cedric Mullins leadoff still hit Adley second and Gunnar Henderson's probably going to hit third on this team at some point next year. Like, I think, do you agree with me once we get to, you know, maybe June ish, like they're penciling Adley Gunner two, three into this lineup pretty much every single day. Yeah, I tend to agree. And actually I think he could even hit leadoff with his on base skills, the way they've developed in the chase rate. So he has long at bats, gives uh, the next guys in the lineup uh, more chance to see the starting pitcher at the beginning of the game. But yeah, I think he's hitting, no lower than third by June, July. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty much locked in. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun just, uh, just thinking about what this lineup could look like. If they can bring in a guy from the outside, you get a, you know, an off season of Adley and Gunner, healthy, working as big leaders, getting ready to go and the talent you have around them. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and really, Bob, what was the most fun about this season is just, the Orioles had two guys who at one point were the top prospect in baseball. And I know Gunner's sample size was much larger, but both of them lived up to the potential pretty much immediately. I know Adley had the little rough stretch right when he got called up, but at the end of the season, they both lived up to it. And that's where I wanted to finish. Not only does that say great things about Gunner and Adley, I think that says good things about the Orioles drafting and their development process moving forward that makes it not just getting excited about Gunner Henderson, but the next guy to come up, whether it's Westberg or Ortiz or Kowser, that it could look like that for them too. Yeah, I think one of the things I was listening to Fangraph's audio, they had an interview with Eve Rosenbaum on there, and she had a very exciting comment about how they feel just super confident they're, that they're a player development monster or something like incredibly positive in that regard. And it's like the confidence to feel that way, obviously buoyed by Adley and Gunner, but yeah, there's plenty of more to come and who knows how good this team can get pretty fast. If we're having this discussion this time next year and Gunner hit 300 with 35 bombs and 20 steals and, you know, he's he's the rookie of the year, don't be surprised because uh, this guy is really good and we are happy to have him hopefully in Baltimore for a while. And, hey, maybe we get you back on here in a, in a month or two because the Orioles have signed him to a long-term extension already. That would be the perfect offseason by the Orioles. But, Bob, thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead and uh, let everybody know where they can find your podcast as well to get some more Orioles minor league info. Of course, this was fun. Thanks for having me back. But yeah, you can follow us on Twitter at BSL on the Verge, um, and you can subscribe on all your podcast platforms, Spotify, iTunes, and we're on YouTube as well. We go live every Monday night around eight o'clock most of the time. Uh, subscribe to our page there. We'll be on there at the time of recording this uh, tonight to talk about the major league pitching staff. We're going to actually have a couple episodes talking about the majors. How about that? There you go. And as, as I always say, if you're listening to this podcast here, go listen to On the Verge as well. Uh, get all your Orioles information up and down the system. But that was Bob Phelan, of course, of BSL On the Verge, covering all things Orioles minor leagues. We thank him so much 
for joining us. We will be back here with the podcast tomorrow, continuing our 2022 player review series, looking into all the O's who made this season so special in Birdland. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.